call this meeting to order. The first thing we will do is uh, take care of some bills that uh, we've been asked, of, we've been asked by uh, Delegate Hope to take House Bill 2372 and lay it on the table. So moved. that have to uh, run background checks as a pre-employment condition, you know, a condition of, of employment, and uh, has to be run through the Virginia State Police. Uh, a few, right, right now at the moment, only child care facilities that are licensed through DSS have to do the fingerprint scans and they, or fingerprint background check, and they're able to do that through a live scan device. Other organizations right now aren't mandated uh, to do that, but that a, a fingerprint background check is available. But if, for example, uh, uh, a hospice wanted to run a criminal background check on someone and use a nationwide fingerprint search, the current way that you'd have to do that is to go to a state police uh, uh, office and actually have the person fingerprinted and then it has to be mailed off and it takes about six weeks to get the results back. Uh, so it's a long and arduous process. And if you're doing that as a pre-employment uh, process it, it slows things down to the point that you really can't can't effectively use that because if someone's looking for a job they don't have time to wait on six weeks to, you know, they'll, they'll want to find a job with somebody else so what this bill seeks to do is to allow uh, any of the organizations that are in that category which would be uh, home care hospice uh, child daycare any, any of those things to be able to utilize the live scan devices and even if they wanted to, to put one in their own office, so long as they went through and met all of the criteria and also bore all of the expense that would be behind it. So there's no fiscal impact on this. It just simply allows them to have access to it and expands the, the search because the, the other advantage that this gives is that when you are doing a background check and you're only running it through the Virginia State Police in Virginia, you get only those convictions and barrier crimes that are in Virginia. But the nationwide search covers every state all at once. And so it would be a better background check, it would be faster, it would be easier, the expense would be borne by the employers, and it just helps move things along to better stream when you're gonna be putting people in situations that are largely unsupervised with a vulnerable population. And I would also add too, I just really wanted to, to, to thank uh, uh, Lieutenant Hook from the Virginia State Police is here. He has been very helpful in working through this and we worked together to get the substitute uh, to this point. I don't think Virginia State Police has a position on this bill. I'll not speak for him, but uh, uh, yeah, let's, he's sitting right back there. He's, he's <laughs> Chris says y'all love it. <laughs> he, he's nodding. But, but has been very, very helpful in working out the language on this. Any, any questions from the committee? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, uh, Delegate Head, you mentioned that child care facilities currently do this? Child, child care, if, you, if you're a licensed child care uh, agency, if, you, if it's licensed by Department of Social Services, mm -hmm. you're already required to do this. To and have a scanner? Not to have a scanner, but to have access to the scanners that are in around in the Commonwealth now. 
they already have to do this, but as, as pre employment screening, that was legislation a uh, year or two ago. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, how many more? So we are going from having to go to these places to do the live scan or the fingerprints to actually having them in the place. Just not not necessarily having to, Mr. Chairman, but just just or the option to. having the option to. Um, how many types of organizations could and would have these devices? That would, I mean, I have no way of really knowing a count on that. Uh, they are fairly expensive, so it would be, it would only be, uh, in order to have one in uh, a private place of business that, that was using it for their own screening, They'd have to be doing enough background checks that they'd be willing to invest anywhere. I've, we've seen these anywhere from three thousand to ten thousand dollars to get it set up. So I mean, it's a pretty expensive piece of equipment, and and computer equipment, and then there's a, there's encryption that has to be put together with this. There's a lot of there, there's a lot involved in getting it right to be able to um, to be current, and then there are ongoing updates that have to be paid for along. So I would I would imagine that the vast majority of folks would be using the facilities that are already out there. And I don't know, perhaps Lieutenant Cook would be able to tell us how many are out there. I think they are, they, they, I don't remember, I don't remember what the, you said they are, there's, there's one within a half hour's ride. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, the um, field prep, which you is don't the, introduce yourself. I'm you sorry, Keenan Buck with, with the Virginia are. State Police. Uh, field print that is, which is, has the state contract through the Department of Social Services to provide all of the fingerprint based uh, live scan transactions for uh, daycare providers has, pursuant to that contract, they have a live scan device within 35 miles of every resident of the Commonwealth. They're found mainly at places like those uh, UPS type shipping facilities, those private shipping facilities, other places like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, um, I think the other question that was posed about how many of these entities there are out there, I can't give you a number of entities. I can tell you we do 300,000 roughly fingerprint-based background checks every year. Of course, many of those are for other government agencies and things that are doing them through their own live scan uh, mm -hmm. machines already. So this takes that to the next level and says whether field print or through an, uh, an, another organization that chooses to do so, they could get a device if it was economical for them and submit them directly to us. Um, uh, so it's, um, as Delegate Head said, it's optional. Uh, frankly, we, we feel like we could have done this without specific statutory authorization, although we certainly understand Delegate Head's desire to put this out there in a way that any organization can see it and avail themselves of it if they choose to. <coughs> Two more questions. Then I'll, then I'll shut up. And go to the next um, so, I guess the first one will be for, for state police. So, if you end up with uh, you know a few thousand folks that decide they want to do this, because they have a like a hospice or or something, your 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 current system can can handle the the small influx of folks who are going to be inquiring about the fingerprinting. Um, because you're going to yes. have these live scans sending you. More requests. So. Right. So what it's going to do? These um, any any organization that is uh, that has the desire to do this presumably is already submitting us a hard card for fingerprints. When we get those hard cards in, we scan them into the same system. So this is just a way of bypassing that step and getting them in electronically on the front end. And the last question, I guess, is for um, when you have the information right for your stuff, how long do you? Well, we are we are required by statute to keep it in their file as long as they are an employee and for a period. I think I, put, I looked at we, we have to keep past employee files for ten years, and then everything has to be destroyed. And but but it's all kept secure by statute. By statute. So, and you're also you're also prohibited by statute from disseminating that information to anybody who doesn't have a reason to see it. We're not even allowed to show the employee themselves their own file on that. Uh, it, it, is, it is for pre-employment and for internet file and, and, it, and it's, it's private information. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. 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 Thank
any, any more questions from the committee? All right, anybody that's here to speak in favor of this? Anybody here to oppose it? Hearing none. Twenty-seven ninety-seven. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, do you have a, an amendment to make sure we're Let's go ahead and move the amendment. Um, I'm going to get a motion to do that. So moved. Second. Okay, motion has been made. Second. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, go ahead. Uh, as amended, 2797. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This bill is fairly simple and straightforward. It raises the age when a person can purchase a semi automatic assault weapon style weapon from a licensed dealer with specific carve-outs. And what this bill is intended to do, I, I am hopeful that you all will agree with the premise behind it, is to prevent a high school student, age 18 or older, from buying a semi-automatic weapon from a licensed dealer. This idea came from, through my travels, as I traversed the Commonwealth on behalf of the Safe Virginia Initiative, trying to come up with some common sense ideas for preventing some of these tragedies that we've all seen. In this instance, the, what this legislation would do is it would prevent a high school student from leaving the high school, purchasing an assault weapon, and returning to the school. There are carve-outs for military. There are carve-outs for those with the GED. Why, again, with regard, is, would there be a carve-out for the GED? Because, again, we're talking about preventing the high school student from leaving the premises and returning to the high school. As we know, the, safe, the uh, Select Committee on School Safety was created to focus on, come up with some legislation that could actually save lives, keep our, keep our kids safe. The Safe Virginia Initiative was created to ensure that we could come up with some common sense gun safety legislation, all again with the goal of preventing tragedy, keeping our kids, our most vulnerable, safe, and uh, while respecting the Second Amendment. There are carve-outs here, again, for the military, and there are carve-outs for people with uh, GEDs. We, this bill does not take guns away from these individuals in the sense that they can still have a long gun, a firearm. They can still have their uh, other, other weapons, but again, it will prevent these individuals in high school, age 18, 19, and 20, from having an assault weapon. Again, I, I hope it will be the will of this body to pass this bill. And there's a carve out, as I mentioned, for the armed forces as well. It's a very narrow scope focused around safety, and specifically <coughs> safety of our children in school. All right, any questions from the committee? Lori Haas, I'm with the Educational Fund and the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. We support the bill. It's very narrowly crafted, as we've seen when 
person's intent on doing harm use higher capacity weapons, especially semi-automatic assault style weaponry, the lethality is greater and increased. There's studies that show the lethality increases when using these firearms, these types of firearms. This is it just does exactly what the patron says. It's a narrow population. It is persons enrolled in high school still going to school, still interacting with our children and their classmates and their teachers. However, <coughs> it may be above the age of majority, which is 19 or 18, 19, or 20. So it's a very small sub uh, subset and a population that frankly is probably not quite ready. If they haven't graduated from high school, they might not be prepared or have the um, skill set and ability to know what to do with these firearms. And if they want to do harm in a school setting, and have access to these um, high-powered lethal weapons, then they can, in fact, do more harm. I think and there's so many reasons that this bill is a good bill, and again, very narrowly focused on a subset of the population, and we support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move on our Virginia Center for Public Safety. We support the bill. I think. Anyone uh, that would like to speak in opposition Mr. Chairman, Chris Kopacki, representing the National Rifle Association. I uh, appreciate your time today. We think there's some very serious legal issues with this bill. I kind of see it akin to requiring the literacy test to vote, which we know that the Federal Congress went ahead and banned back in the 1960s. Um, you know, what other constitutional right is deprived or void because of educational requirement? Um, we do also think that this would open Virginia to some significant legal challenges and suspicions of prejudice. Um, and it's really been relatively poorly conceived as we stated those. Um, so for those reasons, we strongly oppose it. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, uh, Bob Sadler, South Reg. As much as I appreciate the minority leader really narrowing her focus, I have two problems. One is when I was 18, Congress put a fully automatic weapon in my hand and sent me to do Congress's dirty work to be told that I can't be trusted to be semi-automatic at 18, 19, 20, that bothers me. My other problem is we're again talking about the tools. If we deny them these, they'll just turn around and build pipe bombs or rent rider trucks, do their damage that way. We really need to focus on identifying these people, getting them treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I think it's quite clear that this narrowly focused bill, the, the goal of this narrowly focused bill, and I'd like to think that all of us here, my colleagues, as we represent our 80,000 people, can agree that we're here to ensure that our constituents and Virginians are safe. We're here to pass bills that will make a difference, improve our constituents' lives, and literally save lives. I don't think there's any doubt that this bill could save lives. I know in the past the concern has been that you're, you believe that some, some people believe, and some of these organizations that have spoken today believe that our goal is to take guns away from individuals. The guns are not, I mentioned again, being taken away from individuals. We still have these individuals, 18, 19, and 20, enrolled in high school, still have the opportunity to exercise their Second Amendment right and have guns. What we are saying is, do we want these 18, 19, and 20 year olds to have assault weapons? Where they could leave their high school, purchase an assault weapon, and return to the high school. We have all seen some of these tragedies play out time and time again. If there is an option, if there is an ability for us as legislators to pass a bill which would save lives, I'd like to think that we can do so today. We're talking about assault weapons. We're not talking about all guns, semi-automatic. And if there, as far as it being crafted, if there are other ideas and suggestions, I would open this up to you know welcome my colleagues to come up with a better way of wording 
here. And uh, again, you know, you know the goal here. And I'd like to think that we all share that common goal. It's very narrowly focused. So. Thank you. <coughs> said we're we're here to improve the lives of our constituents and arguably save lives do we really think that 18 19 and 20 year old high school students need to possess need to be able to purchase a semi-automatic weapon all right uh, <coughs> this time this vote on the board be passed by Seven ninety seven as amended. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. members of the subcommittee. I'm here on House Bill 2777. Um, so this bill arises from actually what happened a few years ago when there was an agreement um, regarding protective orders. Um, and it was the Virginia House Bill 1391. Um, so right now, um, when someone's issued a protective order against them, the firearm, they must surrender, the, the individual must surrender their firearm. So looking at the law, I realized that there was no sort of guidance. There's a grace period for somebody to surrender, 24 hours, right? But there was no sort of guidance about how is this <coughs> supposed to happen. The individual's supposed to take it to, is it okay for the person to take it to the neighbor? Is it okay for the person to drive it to a police department? And so all I wanted to do with this is to make sure that we are actually protecting individuals um, and providing them more information on the surrender of their firearm. So the, the relevant language is on line 239, and it's basically to uh, develop guidance documents and instructions on the surrender and transfer of firearms by a person who is subject to a protective order and it directs the uh, Department of Criminal Justice Services to do it. Um, so that, that's basically the bill.
the one who come and get the weapon. And so at this point in time, there's no specific procedure in place to allow this. Exactly, right. I mean, and so there's confusion, and I, I didn't mention my comments. I mean, the law enforcement supports this, or at least the police in my area, because I like to say people are confused, but they are concerned that within that 24-hour period, what happens? Like, do they need to notify the police that they still have the firearm in their possession? They could not get to a family member or somebody to transfer the firearm. And it's just to provide more guidance, and it's actually good, good by it that I'm trying to actually protect people and their, and their and their firearms so that they can get the <coughs> firearm back eventually, but so that they're not also caught in a loophole. Um, so, and there's no guidance about what happens, you know, if they're not able to transfer within that time. Because all of them with protective orders, I mean, you may not be able to be in a certain, within a certain, I don't know how do I say this, um, not diameter, but a certain geographic region. Right, you may have to stay at least 10 miles away. But what if that family member that you need to transfer is there? So sort of guidance that when judges on their bench give to somebody, they will give them sort of guidance about how to go about complying with the order. And that's really all I, I, I would like to see happen. And also getting guide, the police sort of guidance on how they can handle the situation so that we're not you know, making somebody subject to a violation of the protective order. That's all I was meant by this. Uh, does the protective order, uh, order says you cannot go back, or you have to be supervised if you go back to the residence of the person the protective order has been taken out against or not? During the time that the order is in effect? Yes. Um, I, you can't go to the residence no. of the protected person if you're subject to a protective order. What if you share that? Ma'am, do you want to speak? Um, my name is Brandy Singleton. I'm from the Office of the Executive Secretary with the court system. And I just wanted to um, perhaps clarify something that the, the delegate said. Um, DCJS has historically produced some materials. I know after VAWA was passed, they produced a brochure explaining the federal law about um, relinquishing firearms if, if because of a protective order or certain types of violations, and those materials are available on the court system website. I would not anticipate, however, and would have concern if the anticipation is that judges would be handing this out in court or explaining people's rights to them. Similar materials already exist, um, and they are made available perhaps in the courthouse, but I just wanted to express that concern. Thank you. I would prefer two seconds, right. but I would give two minutes to right. Delegate Freitas. You get to go first. I'll, I'll go ahead and move. Oh, okay. No, I just, uh, I, I am honestly really concerned. I'm not everyone has access to the uh, computer or, you know, to go look and then say, oh, let me see, let me flip these documents. And not all courthouses have it. And, um, I just noticed that there is a loophole, and, and I mean, law enforcement has expressed concern. That's why I'm here. I'm rarely in front of you all, um, so um, that that's why I'm here. And uh, so that is the will of the committee to be well, behind it. That's what it will do. I'll tell you, law enforcement in my area do not want to be involved with it. They don't want to. They don't want to, to have that responsibility of of having to keep up with the firearms and. Dealing with them, and they, and they express to me that the code says that you have 24 hours to find someone who can legally possess them, and that's what you know, you know you're supposed to do. So. All right, vote on the board. Motion is to pass by the executive Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, take care.
two more bills. Uh, one of them is done with the Bales bill, and uh, unfortunately, uh, he's, he's not with us yet. Praying for his safe return Monday. But uh, that'll get Tyler. Yes, ma'am, and this is this is our the last planned meeting. meeting, so okay. Well I will present our delegate Bill Bill. His bill to the college bill is eighteen ninety-nine. And basically um, his bill will require the still handgun permitted applicant to demonstrate competence with a handgun by completing an in-person course with a state certified or National Rifle Association certified firearm instructor. Basically, on a current law, the applicant must complete an electronic video or online course to demonstrate competency. And basically, his um, bill removes that option for concealed handgun permit applicants. And basically, um, Delta Bell wanted to get <coughs> that bill because electronic video or online course, a person may be um, be uh, false, uh, diligently trained to have safety on guns. So basically he's saying that a person can take this online course and not be who he say he is and uh, won't have an actual safety um, as far as using a gun. And so his bill just simply moves that option and says that anybody who's applying for a, a um, permit should take a course in person. All right, anybody here that would like to speak in favor of this bill? Mr. Chairman, Andrew Goddard, Virginia Center for Public Safety. I took this course when it was first allowed by Tony Cucinelli putting it into law. I took the course and uh, <coughs> answered any of the questions without actually watching the video because they were so infantile. Um, at the end of it, I printed out a certificate that said I was competent with a handgun. Because if I was competent, I had never had my hand on a handgun. I never put my hand on a handgun. I fired rifles and other things, but I never fired a handgun. I wouldn't say I was competent, but I was allowed to go and get a concealed handgun permit and carry a concealed handgun to public when if I took it out of that holster, it would have been the first time I touched it if I didn't put it in there in the first place. And I think that, that's a bit nonsensical. We need to know that a person is competent and they know the laws. And you can't do that with a keyboard. You can't show a competency with a, with a, with a car by sitting at a keyboard and, and passing a test at the keyboard. You can't show the competency to fly an airplane by sitting at the keyboard and playing flight simulator. We don't accept it. So we shouldn't allow people to prove their competency with a handgun by sitting at a keyboard. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Lori Haas. I'm with the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence and the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. We support the bill. You know, in-person training makes sense on so many levels. We require our law enforcement agents and agencies to, un to undergo hundreds of hours, literally, um, training with their um, with weapons before they're issued their service revolver. You know, that training encompasses many areas, um, judgment and retention and, you know, defensive use and offensive use and all, all manner of um, safe use of a firearm. I would like to think that our concealed handgun permit holders have that same training. I suspect that many in this room already do. You do it on, of your own volition, and I respect that and I appreciate it. But not everybody is like the responsible gun owners in this room. Some people just can go out and get it. And, you know, and as Mr. Goddard described, you really can be anyone and falsify, you know, sitting at a, at, at a online, they don't, the online courses don't have any way to identify you. Are you who you say you are? Is there an identification process that's involved in that? Um, number two, you, you really might not be able to handle a handgun and its uses and the appropriate way to carry it, the appropriate way to use it, the appropriate way to um, 
handle that in public in other situations. I think in-person training is what we require of law enforcement to carry in public. I think it's a small step to ask um, those who want a concealed handgun permit to do the same. The, we can uh, keep our community safe, and I think this is one step in that direction, would be to require persons um, to have some in-person training with that handgun. And for those reasons, we support Delegate Bill. Bill, thank you. Chairman, gentlemen, Bob Sather, South Richmond. Uh, if it makes anyone in this room feel better, I have never, and I pledge I will never, recommend that anyone carry just on this online course. People tell me they've taken, I say, then you went to the range, right? This course exists for a reason. Localities across this country, mostly major urban centers, use, uh, they uh, manipulate training as in order to insert a financial obstacle to gun ownership. It costs between five and six hundred dollars just to get approval to own a gun in DC, for example. And the purpose this course serves is as a bulwark against artificially in inflating the cost to make it cost prohibitive. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, Chris go back again. House Bill 2548. Look at Rush. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Cooper Chairman. 
chairman, members of the subcommittee. Um, sorry for my tardiness. I was, I was the fi fi final quorum guy, so I didn't wait it out. Um, what uh, House Bill 2548 does is, um, so, so to get your uh, Second Amendment rights restored, you must go to the uh, Commonwealth's attorney in the county uh, and a judge in your county where you reside. And then those records are kept at uh, the, the clerk of court's office there. So what this, and they're not put into the state police database for road officers. So this, um, what this bill does is allow that, that information to get into the uh, hands of uh, working road deputies, road officers, road state troopers, to avoid the situation that, um, that has happened where um, a gentleman was riding to work, he had a firearm in his vehicle, he had been, um, Convicted of uh, a felony in the 70s, he had his rights restored, and then he was arrested and, and taken uh, uh, to uh, to jail. And so he ended up staying over overnight. Um, so uh, this was brought to me. That that situation happened down here. This was brought to me by a Christianburg police officer who had a similar situation, and he said, uh, "Delegate Rush, <coughs> I stopped this guy at three o'clock on a Friday. If I would have stopped him at 5:05, we wouldn't have been able to get the information, and he would stay." stay the uh, weekend in jail. So all I want to do is get this information. This doesn't change any way that the rights are restored. It doesn't change any of that. All this does is get the information to um, road deputies, road police officers, and uh, state troopers who are on the road. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the committee? Sir, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So it goes into the CCRE in, yeah. the, in the bill, and that's the that's the criminal yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe we want to hear from the state police what they have to say about it. Mr. Chairman, Keenan Hook, state police. Um, uh, we appreciate the bill. We, um, matter of fact, we applied for and got a grant this past year to try to do as much as we could in this area voluntarily by um, providing a form for folks where they could submit that along with fingerprints and the restoration order to us voluntarily because we can't compel the courts to send it to us and we would put that on criminal history. Our only two requests with regard to this bill are we would like to have it as a fingerprint based, uh, you know, they send fingerprints in with it so that we be sure that we apply the restoration to the correct person's record. That criminal history database operates off of biometrics. Um, and the second request would be, we'd like to buy a little bit more time. I appreciate the enactment in July of 2020. The criminal history, we're undergoing a lot of criminal history database changes right now, and we're not sure about a July of 2020 target. July of 2021 would give us um, some more comfort there. I do appreciate- Can you split the difference um, January 1? Uh, we'll, we'll take what we can get. <laughs> All right. Give and take, right? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, and I've, I've worked with uh, the state police on this for a couple of years. Worked is a probably a um, mistime, but we've battled each other over this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I would be I would be amenable to the fingerprint requirement and a January 1, January 2, 2021. If that's, if we can do that. Mr. And, and, and Mr. Chairman, what we could do if, if the subcommittee is <coughs> to that is draw this up and work on and, and pass it in full tomorrow if everybody has mm -hmm. the, if, if, if everybody's on board. Mm -hmm. well, uh, so Mr. Chairman. You, you can pass it. Yes, sir. I, uh, Mr. Just so we did it right, that would be more than that we do that. Um, draw up an amendment that uh, the fingerprints are also submitted. And I, think, I think it says it requires two sets. It requires two sets. Um, and that we also change the effective date to January 2, 2021, since the first is a holiday. Is that I, I think that's what code requires or 
CCRC. If we we can do it with. Well, they're, they're the same set of fingerprints, fingerprints just, right? Um, we, we can it, if the if the bill says accompanied by fingerprints, we'll be okay. we're fine. All right, I tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna let uh, <coughs> let Lieutenant Hook and and uh, Ms. May here talk offline and get this straight after. Yes, so now we're talking about the bill as amended to have fingerprints and uh, to go into effect on January 2 of 2021. All right, anybody want to speak in any questions? Anybody? Oh, anybody? All right. Well, well, first off, let's move the amendments. Move the second. And second. Okay. We just move it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. All right. We got the amendments in front of us. Uh, anybody want to speak in favor of House Bill 2548 as amended? Mr. Chairman, Chris, go back again to the NRA very quickly. We don't support the bill. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Bob Seth of South Richmond. Uh, I know that uh, Delegate Rush brought this bill last year, so he's been working on it for at least two years. I want to thank him for his dedication and his diligence. His first I know it's a motto is here, that's why he brought up the data. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to speak against this legislation? All right. Move to report. Second. All right. So I guess there is a motion to report. As amended, uh, we will uh, leave that up to Ms. May and um, Lieutenant Hook and the chairman will, will have that for us tomorrow's full committee. And so, uh, one vote on the voting board. Thank you, Delegate Rush. Thank you, Thank you Mr. You. Chairman. We appreciate your battle. All right, I think that concludes this uh, committee. Uh, appreciate everybody's hard work. Glad to get this done. And we'll see everybody in the morning.